I'm really excited. If you uh, have you access your Bibles, if you'll go ahead and grab them, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, we'll get there in just a little bit. Uh, I'm really excited. We are starting a new series this week, a four-week uh, series about one of the greatest men in all of the Bible outside of Jesus. And his name is Elijah. And we're going to be uh, diving into his life quite a bit uh, today in the next two or three uh, Sundays after uh, today. Uh, I want to give you this warning right from the very get-go. Uh, today's message, uh, teaching time, is going to be a little bit deep. For some of you, you're going to hear it, just being honest here, you're going to hear it and you're going to think, huh, I didn't need that. And it's probably true. But better tuck it away because you may down the road need it. Others of you are going to hear it and say, wow, that's the best thing I've heard in a long, long time. And then there'll be some of you someplace in between those two. But I'm just telling you, today's going to be a little deep. Next uh, three weeks, not quite the same. We're going to look at a little bit different things. So we're going to take a look at Elijah. Let me give you a little context of what is going on during this time uh, of Elijah. While Elijah is a prophet, he is living in the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Bible tells us <clears throat> that there had been 200 years of evil kings. 19 consecutive evil kings, not just ineffective leaders, I am talking evil kings. Though there was one particular by the name of Ahab, he had a wife named Jezebel, just the name alone <clears throat> tells you something about her. Some people say she was the most wicked woman to ever live. The Bible tells us that Ahab and his wife Jezebel, that they did more evil than any of the previous kings. 200 years of evil. During this time, idolatry was prevalent. That the evil kings would do their best to turn the people's hearts uh, away from the God uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they would try to turn their hearts away from the real God to false gods. To the gods of Baal. The gods of Asherah. And oftentimes they go so far in doing this, I can't even imagine this, they would go so far in doing this that the wives, the mothers would sacrifice their kids to these false gods. That they would go into the temples and they would engage in sexual activities with prostitutes and then call it worship. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. It got even more evil from there. This was a very, very dark time of corruption. We're talking about major scandals going on, crazy amount of idol worship going on, and God finally says, enough is enough. Now, as you were reading through Kings, reading through the Old Testament, you would have thought that God would have sent a, a massive army to wipe out King Ahab and, and uh, take his reign out and displace him, but that isn't what he did. God, in 1 Kings 17, did what he often does. He raised up one person. One person to take a stand. And you know what? God still does that today. He raises up one person to take a stand. He, he may rise up one leader at work to, to take a stand for integrity. He, he may take, uh, rise up one teacher a, a, in the school to change the entire faculty. He, he may raise up one person to take a stand for what is right in politics. He may rise up one student to influence their classmates. See, God often uses one person, one person to make a difference. And this morning, as we're taking a look at Elijah to lay the foundation for what God does in our lives, I want to take a look at what God did in the life of Elijah. So let's start with the name Elijah. What does it mean? It comes from three root words. L-I-J-A. Just like it's broken out, L stands for Elohim, or it stands for God. The I in the middle is a personal pronoun for my. And then Jah, J-A-H, comes from Jehovah. And so when you put it all together, if you're taking notes, his name literally means this. My God is Jehovah. My God is the real God. And so when God raises up this prophet to take a stand against Ahab, by his very name, just coming into the presence there, he is making a testimony he says that my Lord, the Lord God is the true God. My God is Jehovah. And so Elijah comes in. He takes a stand against Ahab, who had turned so many people's hearts away from the one true God. So he comes in and he challenges him face to face. The first time we even read about Elijah is in 1 Kings chapter 17, where we're going to start at today. 
we, we don't have much background on the prophet. We just know that he is a prophet. And we know simply where he is from. Let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, from Tish, from Gilead. He's identified from where he is at, from where he is from, but that's going to change soon enough. We're, we're going to see a change there. Now let's pick it up. He, says, he said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, I don't want you to miss the importance of this. We, we read this and we kind of can skip over it. Elijah is being incredibly bold here. He is being incredibly direct with Ahab. He says, the Lord God that I serve, whom I believe in, who I trust, there's not going to be dew nor rain for the next few years. See, he is challenging their god Baal. Ahab worshipped Baal, and that was one of Ahab's mighty gods was, was Baal. Well, Baal was the god of rain. He was the god of dew. He was the god uh, of water. But it's bigger than that. Because think about where they are living. When, when Elijah makes this proclamation and says there's going to be no water for a long, long time, that, that would mean economic shutdown. The, the economy in that day was driven by agriculture, and if there isn't rain, guess what doesn't happen? Nothing grows. Today, it would look a lot like this. There would be no gas at any gas stations, more than what we've seen on the news. Banks wouldn't be lending money to anybody. Actually, banks wouldn't even be giving you your money. Your electricity would be gone. There would be people starving to death on the side of the road. Unemployment would hit 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. It would be terrible. It would be awful. And so the man of God stands down this evil king, Ahab. He, he says, there's going to be no more rain. Water's gone. Now, this would take tremendous faith. To say this. And so as he is saying this to Ahab, you can just hear the music in the background. It kind of like dun 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 dun. And you'd expect this big fight, and Ahab be like throwing off his gloves and be like, it's time to fight over this. These are fighting words, and Elijah's probably ready for this, probably wanting to do this. But that isn't what happened. God does something different. God comes to Elijah and says, Elijah, you need to go into a season of hiding. You need to go away for a time being. And so for some a time for quite some time, God takes Elijah away, and he leads him away so he can do so much more in him, so he can work in his life. Why? Why would God do that? I think God does that because there's so much more than God wants to do through Elijah. That, that's just the beginning. God wants to do so much more, but he knows he's got to work in Elijah's life, and he's got to make some changes and some uh, character differences. Yeah, and we're going to see as we look at this text that God is going to shape uh, Elijah. It's as if God is saying, man, there's so much more that I need to do in you because there's so much more I want to do through you. And so God takes Elijah through some seasons. I see three seasons of preparation to get Elijah ready for greater things, bigger things. The first season is this, it's isolated pain. Elijah is very alone. He has no one to call out to. He has no one to bounce things off of. He's hurting very privately. He's by himself in this season of hiding. We would pick this story up in verse 2. Remember in verse 1 he says, no more rain. Verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Now this uh, word, Kareth, Kareth in Hebrew means cut off. It means you're going to be cut off from the blessings. It means cut down, like you're cutting a tree down. You're going to be cut off. You're going to be cut down. You get this sense that God is saying, I'm going to take you through a season of breaking. I'm going to take you through some painful things. I'm going to cut you down. I'm going to humble you. But we're going to learn some humility during this time. I'm going to teach you to be totally dependent on me. I'm going to teach you some things. I'm going to humble you privately before I can use you publicly. Elijah, I'm going to do something in you, then later on you're going to do more than you could ever imagine, more than you could even dream about. You see, so often people in the Kareth Ravine, they're in a season of pain. Some hurt is going on, and in that pain, so often we ask the question, where are you, God? God, where are you at? What, what, what are you doing? And oftentimes, I promise you this, God is right there with you. He's doing a deep work. Oftentimes, he's doing a deep work in your life. He's moving in a powerful way. 
kind of like the story I read of the little bird flying south for the winter. Now let me tell you right up front, this story is both gross, sad, and funny, all at the same time. I tried it out on my kids, and they were disappointed they couldn't be here. They had to be in kids' church for this. Little buddy's flying south for the winter, but he got a late start. He didn't leave when all of his buddy friends left, and he got a late start, and of course he runs into a snowstorm. The snow on the sleet starts hitting the bird, and it's beating on him. His little wings start to freeze, and they're getting heavier and heavier. And then he calls out a mayday because he knows his wings are getting too heavy. They're getting icy, and he can't make it. And here he comes down for a crash landing. And he plummets to the ground, and then he lays down on the ground. He's being pelted by the snow and the ice, and it's getting colder and heavier. He was getting so cold, he, he was starting to freeze up. He realized he couldn't fly. He, he understands he's going to die a horrible death here, and he thinks to himself, man, this is the worst thing ever. I'm going to freeze to death right here. All of a sudden, a cow comes along. A cow stands over him and poops right on him. You didn't see that coming, did you? A cow poops right on him. That's the gross part of the story. Just a load of manure falls on the little birdie, and he thinks, oh man, I thought this was bad, but it just went downhill. I was just going to freeze to death, but now I'm under this poop. This is the worst thing ever. After a few moments, the heat from the manure started to cause the little birdie to thaw out. He's getting warmer and warmer, and he starts to shake his little wings. And they're getting stronger and stronger, and he thinks, oh, I may live, I may live, I may survive this. And he's so excited, he, he starts chirping in excitement, chirp, 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 chirp. Then out of the corner of his eye, Satan's pet, a cat, is coming. And the cat heard all the little chirping of the little birdie, and he eats the bird. Yeah, that's the sad part of the story. If you're wondering, let me give you three morals from this story. There is a point. <laughs> Lesson number one, everyone who drops manure on you is not your enemy. Lesson number two, everyone who digs you out is not necessarily your friend. Lesson number three, and maybe most importantly, when you find yourself in manure, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Some of you right now, you're thinking, you know, I'm living in the with ravine. I'm there. I'm being broken. I'm, I'm hurting. Those things I used to count on, I can't depend on anymore. But there's this pain going on. I'm telling you, God might be saying, I'm doing something in you. I know you're in this pain. I know you're in this darkness. I know you're in this hope, but there's some, prep uh, some preparatory work going on in you. I'm teaching you something. I'm doing this work in you so that I can do more through you. Some of you find yourself right there. You find yourself at that period in life, and this is going on, and it's not fun. It's difficult. It's hard. Elijah was there for months and months. He, he's all alone. The great writer A.W. Tozer is quite deep. He says, it is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Think about that. It is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly unless he has hurt him deeply. If you find yourself in this season, th this is going to sound strange. I'm going to tell you that right from the front. Uh, be encouraged. God is working in you. You're not alone. God is with you. He's moving in a powerful way. Second season, we see Elijah in, and we see the season of total dependence. Total dependence. As God is shaping Elijah, as he is molding him into the man of God that he wants him to be, we see Elijah going through this season of total dependence. Elijah is going to discover that he can't depend on anything else in his life other than God. Look at verse 4 with me. It says, You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Let me point out one important here, point here. He did not say bread and veggies. Bread and meat. Bread and meat. Amen. Thank you. But don't miss it. God does a serious miracle right here. He, he does a very, in the middle of this drought, no rain, no dew, there's no water on the land, but... This brook comes up so Elijah can drink. Then there's this heavenly catering service. Every morning and every evening, God uses the ravens to, to bring bread and meat to the prophet Elijah. God is very clearly telling Elijah, no matter what is going on, I'm going to be faithful. 
No matter where you find yourself, you can count on me to provide for you. Many of you may find yourself there right now. You, you used to trust in something for your security, but it's gone. And you don't have anything else to, to count in. You don't have anything else to trust in, but the giver of life, the giver of all good things is there. You are learning that God will always be there for you. There's a single mom that knew this all too well. She was a very strong Christian lady, and every day she would uh, loudly pray. In her apartment, she would pray to God. She would worship him and thank him for his provision, for walking in his life. But there was a problem. As a lot of apartments tend to be, the walls were thin, and it was noisy. Next door to her lived an atheist who did not appreciate her worship, did not appreciate her praying. And that's in God. But day in and day out, she would pray, and she would worship God, and he would tell her. The atheist would tell her, she's crazy. There's no God. How can you believe in God? Fast forward one day, there's more month left than money. She's crying out to God. God, you've always provided for me in the past. I know your provision will be there. You, you've always come through. I know you'll do it again. My, my kids and I are hungry. Please provide food so we can eat. The atheist hears all this, and he has all that he can handle. And so he runs out to the grocery store, buys some food, brings a couple of sacks of food, drops on her doorstep, beats on the door, runs to his apartment. She comes out, finds this food, and she's like, thank you, Lord, you're so, so good. The man can't take that. God would get the credit for this. So he comes out, and he's like, you fool, there is no God. He didn't do that. I did. I did it just to prove to you there is no God. She praised God even more. She said, thank you, Lord. You provide for my needs, and you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> See, God says, I will be your provider. You never know how God's going to work. You never know how God's going to work. I, I will be your provider. I will take care of your needs. When, when you can't depend on what you used to depend on, I will deliver you what you actually need. I want to point some things out from this verse. Don't, don't miss what God did in this miracle here. What did God do? Let, let me point out one thing. I, I, it hit me this morning. I've heard this story a bunch of times in my life. I don't know why it's ever hit me. When did God tell the ravens to get ready to feed Elijah? Before he ever sent Elijah off. He's like, you will feed Elijah. The day's going to come where I need to use you, ravens. Go get ready. God will provide for us. He's walking often behind the scenes. We don't see it. We don't know that it's coming. Second, God didn't give Elijah like two days worth of food or a week's worth of food or a month's worth of food. How much did he give Elijah? A lot of people say, oh, enough for the day. That, that's not the correct answer. He gave him enough for the morning and he gave him enough for the evening. He gave him just what he needed at the time that he needed it. Some of you are learning that right now. You're in a season where you're hurting, there's pain going on, you're alone, you're afraid. But guess what? God delivers enough for the day. You, you may be uncomfortable, and God says, I, I will be your comfort for right now. You, you may not have much, but God says, I, I will be your provision for now. You, you may feel weak, but God says, I'll be your strength for this moment. You, you don't have many friends, and God says, I'll be your friend right now. God is telling us, I will be your daily bread. I'll be your daily bread. And I just got to tell you, God may not bring you more than you need. In fact, God probably isn't going to bring you more than you need. But he will give you exactly what you need. You see, Elijah is in this time, and he's learning to depend on God each and every day for what he needs right then. God is teaching him. He's breaking him. He's humbling him. He's working in him. He's learning total dependence on God, and God is providing for him and meeting his needs and giving him what he needs, which leads Elijah to the third season he is in, and that's unconditional obedience. That there's got to be this season of unconditional obedience. That there's this isolated pain and then there's total dependence, and then there's a season of unconditional obedience. As we're reading through this story of Elijah, when we get to uh, verse 7, the story takes a turn. It, it is flowing right along, and God is providing, God is meeting his needs, and then the story takes a turn, as it often does, for Elijah and also for us in, in life. God starts to change things up. Have you ever felt that way? That you're going along doing great, and then God changes things up. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, sometime later, the brook dried up. 
because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. Now, oftentimes, I, I encourage you, as we are reading through the Bible, to put yourself in the story that we are reading. Put yourself in the uh, place of a character. Uh, imagine being Elijah in this story. God tells you to go confront the king, and so you go confront the king, you wait for a battle, and God says, not yet, go to the, the Kareth Ravine. And you're like, well, what? Well, why am I going there? And then you go there and you do what God tells you to do and you're getting in this routine and things are going pretty well and God says, oh, never mind, water's dried up, time for you to move on, time for you to go somewhere else. What would you be thinking as Elijah? I can tell you what I would be thinking. What? God, what, what, what are you doing? Why have I been here for month after month after month? Why have you been providing for me? Why have you been taking care of me? And then this brook dries up, the ravens go away, and you tell me to move on? Why? You're telling me to go someplace else? Did I not hear you correctly the first time? Did I go to the wrong place? I don't really understand. But Elijah is going to learn a lesson we've got to learn, that the very same God that can give the water can take the water away. And we don't like it, but there's a point to it. Because so often God may dry the brook up. He, he may cause the brook to dry up to give us the courage to leave where we are at to go where we really need to be. To, to move us to where he can really use us. Some of you can so relate to this. You, you're like, Lord, my brook is drying up. I used to trust in my job, but I'm not sure I can trust in my job anymore. I used to trust in my 401k, and that's not doing that great. I'm not sure I can trust anymore. I used to have some great friends, but they've turned to the dark side now. My friendship brook is drying up. I used to think my marriage was great, but man, that, that brook seems to be drying up. I used to be close to God, but man, that brook is drying up. And we wonder about that. Maybe you've heard people say, Something along these lines. Uh, God will guide you by what God will provide you. And you know that's true. That is absolutely true. But that's not the only way God guides. God can also guide you by what he does not provide you. By moving you. The same God who gives the water may cause the book to dry up. To give us the courage to, to move. To take the next step of total obedience. I mean, think about where Elijah has been up to this point. God tells him to go confront, confront the evil king Ahab, and so Elijah takes a step of faith, and he does it. And then God tells him to go to the Kareth Ravine, and Elijah had to be like, well, you, you want me to do what? You, you're going to feed me how? But Elijah took a step of obedience. Then the book dries up. God tells him to go someplace else, and he gave Elijah the courage to be obedient even when it didn't make sense. God tells him to go uh, to Seraphath, a, a town that's about 100 miles away. <coughs> now, this part of the story, man, there's so much in this story, but I can't cover it all. I don't have time, so I'm going to hit the high points. I would encourage you to go back and read the whole story in 1 Kings 17. Read through the end of the chapter, you'll get this whole part of the story. But Elijah takes a step of obedience. He goes where God tells him to go. Like I said, it's about 100 miles or so across the barren land. Remember, they are in a severe drought. He makes this trip. He goes, and when he gets to this town that he's gone to, God tells him, hey, you see that widow over there? She, she's going to provide for you. So he humbles himself, and he goes up to this widow, and he says, ma'am, I'm really thirsty. Could, could you give me a drink of water? And I'm actually hungry. Could you give me a little snack? And the widow can't believe what she hears. She's like, dude, are you the only person alive that doesn't see it? Hasn't rained. We're in a drought. It's not good here. We're, we're dying here. People are dying. I'm a widow. I've got one son. He, he's back at home. I've just got this little bit of flour. I've got just a little bit of olive oil left. I've come out here to get some sticks to go back and make one last meal for me and my boy. And we're going to eat it. And then we're going to die. Because what God was doing in Elijah's life, he says, no, you're not. He looks at this impossible situation. He speaks faith into the situation. He says that the flour you have will not run out. The olive oil you have will not dry up if you do what I say to do. So I want you to go back home, and I want you to bake me a cake. 
Mike's version. Basically what he tells her. And she does it. She does it. And as she is doing this, guess what happens? The, the flour didn't run out. The olive oil didn't dry up. And they eat and eat and eat for months and months and months. You see, Elijah is walking in unconditional obedience. And God again shows up and he supernaturally provides for Elijah. And so this is going and this is happening and this routine is happening in Elijah's life. And then one day, out of the blue, unexpectedly, tragedy strikes this lady's family. For her son unexpectedly dies. And as you can expect, when the son dies, mom freaks out. Is this God's judgment on me because I turned against the one true God to serve these false gods? Uh, Elijah, did you come here so this would happen? You see, because of all that had happened, because God was shaping Elijah, uh, Elijah does something that to our knowledge had never happened up to this point in time. There is no record uh, of it happening. He goes over to her dead son. He, he looks to heaven and he prays. He says, God, I think you can heal this boy. I believe you're going to do it, and I'm asking you to do it. And guess what? The boy comes back to life. Why did all this happen? Why, why did this whole story take place? Because God took Elijah to Kareth Ravine. God took him to a season of total dependence where he couldn't depend on anything else but God. And then God dries up the book and tells him to go off to a distant land. And, well, God wanted to use him, and once again... Elijah's there, and God uses him in a powerful way. God used some horrible things to shape Elijah and the man that he was. Next week, we will see God gives him the faith and the courage to take a stand as one man against 450 prophets, false prophets. But why could Elijah have so much faith to do this? Because he'd been through the ravine. He'd been... All alone. Some of you right now, you're in a season of deep, deep pain. It, it stinks. There's no other way to say it. But God may be saying, I, I'm doing in you something. I'm doing something in you because one day I'm going to do something greater. I'm going to do something greater through you. Remember back in verse 1 where it, it described Elijah the Tishbite? We read where he's from. That's what we know about him. But 23 short verses later, he's not known from where he's from, he, he's known from whom he's from. Look at verse 24, look how the story changes. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. It's not always easy. Someone told me this past week, they were going through some awful stuff, someone said, uh, someone lied to me one time, told me if I gave my life to Christ, everything would be easy. She's like, what a complete lie. Life has been hard, but guess what? I wouldn't want to walk through it any other way. As we talked about it. Truth is, God will allow some of you, all of us in time, to go through the Kareth Ravine. But someday, someday, one day, someone will look at you and say, now, now I know. I can see it. I, I see it. I see it. Wow. You are a woman of God. Wow, you are a man of God. Wow, you are a child of God. And I want, I want to learn more about what you have. God works in powerful ways. Let's pray. God, you move in powerful ways. Lord, I just pray that you would move in a, a, a supernatural way right now, that you would do a supernatural work in, in all of us. Now, I want to pray especially for those here today that are, that are hurting uh, they're going through this uh, pain. They're going through this hurt. They feel themselves being in the, in the Kareth Ravine. Lord, I pray that as they go uh, through tough times, as they go through uh, hard times, trials and tribulations come that way. We know they're not fun. They're difficult. They're hard. But we also know that you can use them to help us grow, to mold us, to shape us into the person that you want us to be, to be more like you. Lord, for those in that situation right now, going through that pain, give them uh, the perseverance to endure what they're walking through. Lord, help us to walk with them during those. Lord, for those that are listening today that need to feel your presence, uh, I pray that they would do so, that they would feel you move in, in a powerful way, that they'd feel your comfort, 
your peace, uh, your strength. I pray they would feel your presence in them in their life. Let them know, but more than just know in their head, help them to feel it in their heart that you are with them each and every day. No matter how deep, dark the valley is, no matter how uh, high the mountain is, or any place in between on that path of life, you are with us. And Lord, finally, I want to pray for those who sense uh, that you are leading them uh, to a new place. Lord, help them to walk in obedience. Now, I know in my life you haven't always given me all the steps that I want to know. You haven't told me how it's all going to turn out. You've just told me to take the next step. Now, help us to do that. Trusting you to lead us, to guide us, to move us, to be with us each and every day. Lord, I thank you for BACC. I thank you for every person here. I thank you for every person at home listening, uh, watching this. Lord, work in us, work through us in a powerful way. Lord, help us to submit ourselves, submit our hearts to you each and every day because you want absolutely what is best for each of us. You are a good, good Father. You are a good God Almighty, and I just thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. And all this I pray in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen.